Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Saludos a todos. I want to welcome you to the third session of the six part series resources that matter for Latinx entrepreneurs. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Garcia and I am the COO for Latino Business Action Network. We are a nonprofit that collaborates with Stanford University with a mission with a mission to strengthen and empower the United States by focusing and uplifting Latino business leaders to grow substantial firms. I, again, thank you for joining us. I invite you to visit our website at lban.us. I also encourage you to visit the resource room where you can learn more about our organization and other organizations that would uh, offer additional resources to small businesses. It is with the support of Bank of America that we launched this webinar series because we recognize the impact of COVID, the impact that it has had on small businesses. But more importantly, we have recognized that for the US to fully recover, it is crucial that you, Latino business owners, recover and not only recover, but also to grow. So for all of us at Alban, we have had the privilege of working with a phenomenal team, uh, a team that is intentional and forward thinking. And I really want to recognize them right now. Uh, Ray Vazquez, Kel Kelly, excuse me, Kathy Gallagher, and Raquel Gonzalez. Allow me to just take a moment and introduce Raquel. She is the president, the president for Bank of America Silicon Valley Market, serving as the company's senior executive and enterprise leader in one of California's most dynamic and diverse regions. As president, Raquel works at across the bank's business lines to help deliver integrated financial services to individuals, families, and businesses. She also leads the work to deploy Bank of America's resources across the market to address social and economic concerns and building strong communities. In addition, Raquel is the Hispanic Latino Strategy Executive for Small Businesses. In this role, she is responsible for the end-to-end -end strategy to deliver the bank's capabilities for our Hispanic Latino clients. She is executive advisor for the Silicon Valley's Asian Leadership Network and Hispanic Latino Organization for Leadership Advancement uh, Employee Networks, as well as the Asian and Hispanic Business Councils. She is certainly active in the local community and she serves on the boards of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the Tech Interactive and Joint Venture Silicon Valley. So will you join me in welcoming Raquel Gonzalez to the stage? Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very proud um, to partner with the Latino Business Action Network on <clears throat> this um, seminar series. Today's session, I know it's going to be focused on a really important topic, and that is how to establish a relationship with your banker. In, at Bank of America, diverse representation across our company, our clients, and our community is a practice that we've had in place for, for a long time. In fact, today we serve nearly 12 million Hispanic Latino individuals and over a million business owners in growing. And this, again, this is all Hispanic clients. In, in terms of learning about what matters to them, last year we released our fourth annual survey of Hispanic owned businesses. And according to the survey, um, Hispanic business owners plan to expand and hire, and that remains strong. Um, they also project strong revenue growth. And in fact, the revenue growth has reached an, an all time high. Um, looking at Hispanic business, own, business owners and what they're projecting and what actually has happened versus looking at um, non Hispanic business owners. And um, there's a really good story there in terms of the growth. You know, a, a, a strong majority of Hispanic business owners about over 90% believe that the small business um, environment will strengthen in their community over the next five years. And about nine out of 10 um, have set ambitious goals uh, to achieve or grow their business in the new decade. But while all that is good news, nearly three quarters of our of Hispanic entrepreneurs say that they have faced obstacles in trying to grow their business or ensure that it remains successful. They, in fact, lack, uh, they cite lack of resources um, or expertise in terms of back management um, 
accessing capital, et cetera, as the top barriers. And so I think today's topic is very timely. And again, listening to what our clients are telling us, it, it really helps us understand um, from a Hispanic you know, entrepreneur what's important and what we could do to, to support their needs. Um, so we're committed to continuing to partner with small business owners, with LBAN, um, to address the barriers and ensure that we are doing our part to help small business owners grow and sustain their business. So again, today's topic is very timely, and I just I appreciate the partnership with Elban and everyone else that is responsible for bringing this really very high quality series um, to Hispanic Latino business business owners. So thank you again uh, for for joining. Uh, I know we have a great audience today, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you for sharing those words. And I 100% agree. This is a timely conversation. Let me provide a little bit of a background. We launched the series um, starting with an economic forecast because what we wanted to do was we wanted to influence the mindset of business owners. We highlighted the projected economic growth and showed how that growth can translate to company growth, how it should and how it can translate to company growth. In our second series, we discussed the capital landscape. We highlighted different lending institutions and their products and how uh, various institutions might be applicable to different businesses depending on the stage of growth that they're in. Today, as Raquel mentioned, we are talking about how to build a relationship with your lender. So let me welcome to the stage our panel. We have Matthew Bradley, he's the Silicon Valley Business Banking Senior Relationship Manager for Bank of America. Welcome, Bradley, or welcome, Matthew. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. All right. And we also have Kenny Salas, who is the COO and co founder of Camino Financial. So, welcome, Kenny. How are you? Hello, buenas tardes a todos. Wonderful. Um, let me just start by sharing in one of our recent research reports from the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative we found that a lack of established banking provider was identified as the third largest barrier in accessing PPP funds in 2020. And we know that the lack of a banking provider is nothing novel, but it was rather further illuminated by, by PPP and during the pandemic. So let's really just dig into this conversation. Um, and I'll start with you, Matthew, if we can. What is important? What are the important questions that an entrepreneur should think about when it comes to identifying a lending institution and also a banker? Yeah, I think uh, first off, before I get into that, I want to congratulate all the business owners for taking the initiative, uh, participating in this. And you know, I think it's it's one thing to own a business. You guys all obviously know how to run your business. But it's an entirely different thing to take the time to educate yourself and learn about what resources are out there. Um, so one of those resources being a financial institution or the banker that you're working with. I think first off, it's most important. Don't judge the banker on the personality. First off, At any environment that we're put into, we're going to encounter a number of different personalities. What I would like to ask of all of you is to be able to give that banker the opportunity to showcase how they advise their clients. Now, I know you guys have been, what, through three of these trainings now and of the capital presentations, but prior to this, you know, the purpose of lending or access to funding, you know, may have been entirely foreign to you. So I think as you become more familiar with credit and when speaking with your banker, share information on situations you foresee and projections of the company that will allow them the opportunity to really advise towards the solutions that they think are going to help. So it's less about probing questions in their response, but more about the transparency that you're willing to offer to them and, and allow them to suggest what their experience has shown. And as bankers, um, especially in the financial centers, I mean, they're seeing hundreds of business owners a year. Um, and that banker should be able to leverage those experiences, both good and bad, to be able to provide insight for things that may be you know, are unforeseen to you, similar businesses, similar situations, similar growth trajectories. Um, so I think that's really the best starting point um, in determining, you know, who you want to use to support your business moving forward. 
I like that. Don't uh, don't judge them by their personality, but allow their experience, leverage their experience and their insight. That's really great, Matt. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I actually want to dive a little bit deeper, Matt, if I could go back to you on another question. You know, Bank mm -hmm. of America, we see Bank of America storefronts um, everywhere, right? And we I want to, so. we hope so. <laughs> I do. Um, one of the phrases that we come and say is have a banker before you need a banker, have no a capital provider before you actually need the capital, right? We talk about that all the time. We uh, instill that in our participants that come through the Stanford scaling program. But let's get really practical here. If an entrepreneur to, were to walk into a Bank of America location before they need capital, what do they talk about? How do you begin to build that relationship? Right. Um, so you mentioned, I mean, Bank of America, we're all over the place. We hope you're seeing our storefronts. We're hopefully easily accessible to you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the bank. You know, one of one of the very first things when you get in there, Bank of America, we pride ourselves on having a number of different specialists inside of all of our financial centers. So the very first thing, make sure you're sitting in front of the right person. Right. And almost all of our financial centers have a specialist focused on small business banking, uh, home loans, consumer accounts, investments. So when you get in and you make that appointment or you're greeted by the person that's there, let them know you're a business owner. Um, it'll allow you an opportunity to make sure you're sitting in front of the right person with the most experience. Now, the question as far as getting access to capital, Jennifer, or what was the question? The question is really, what is step two, right? We want to build a relationship with the lender before we actually need the capital. But what do we what do we, what is step two after you walk through those doors if i'm not looking for capital at this moment what should we be talking about with this uh banker right so again at bank of america i mean it's free advice you know you don't have to open an account you have to you don't have to submit an application but in order to get that advice we need the information um to be able to support that so it may not make sense today but be willing to share, you know, the revenues, um, what they look like, you know, for the current year, the last couple of years, is the business profitable or not? Um, talk a little bit, consider talking about some of the receivables, what those aging reports look like, right? That'll give the banker an opportunity to at least provide an example or, or of potential opportunity and access to capital. Talk about your family, talk about what your guys' goals are. Three years, I mean, current year, three years, five years down the line. We know that our business owners and, and their home life are very closely tied together. Let us look at the whole picture holistically and be able to advise towards that. It doesn't just have to be focused on numbers. Let us, give us the opportunity to get to know you and what's important to you. I really wanna underscore what you said. It is free advice. So for all of those listening right now, it is free advice. It is a get to know you, get to know your goals, get to know your story um, and your ambitions, right? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that really helps uh, cement what needs to happen, right? It doesn't have to be an awkward conversation, but it's just, let me learn from you. Let me learn from you as a banker and as a lending institution. Okay. Kenny, let's go to you. Um, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about Camino Financial, and this is more of a fintech company. So help us understand who you serve, how you serve them, and how does a relationship play into that? Absolutely. So um, uh, first, who we are and who we serve. Uh, so we are a fintech financial technology company that offers microloans to underbanked communities, and we primarily serve the Latino market. In fact, if you visit our website, um, if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see most of the content is in English and in Espanol. Um, uh, I would say pr at least 50% of our um, of our customers are uh, first generation immigrants. They prefer to speak Spanish. So we really built this company to serve the Latino market, considering plus the cultural nuances of the Latino community. And uh, we're also a uh, CDFI, which stands for Community Development Finance Institution. Uh, this is a designated uh, designation granted from the U.S. Treasury, and it gives us access to low cost of capital so that we can give more access at a lower, uh, more access to underbanked communities at a cheaper cost. We just got that. We're probably one of five nationally designated 
CDFIs that offer small business loans. So that's what Camino Financial is, and that's our identity. In terms of how to build the relationship with a fintech, it's a little bit different because we're we are we are built to have a virtual relationship with our customers. We're not a bank. Uh, we focus on, on capitalizing businesses. So one of the best ways for business owners to start building a relationship with, it, with us is actually following us on social media. You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram. In addition to that, I strongly encourage our audience to subscribe to our newsletter. We actually have um, one of the, lar uh, the largest bilingual small business blog on the web. We have over a thousand pieces of content, videos, blogs, infographics, and this is a great way for you to not only read small business news, but the more you subscribe and we, we try to keep it engaging, we can segment you and give you more curated content that fits your stage, whether you're a startup that's barely getting started, is thinking about how do I register my business? How should I pick an accountant, right? Uh, do I need to hire a lawyer right now? These are the type of questions that we're offering and we're, we're, we're doing this virtually. So that that's, I guess that's one of the many ways, I guess you can build the relationship and we can talk a little bit about the capital side when we get there, but that's of course uh, a, a new chapter that we'd love to have the opportunity to have with, with, um, with people on this, on uh, in this uh, video conference. Wonderful. So again, I just want to reiterate that this is a, a different lending institution and you might not see the storefront, but you will see them on social media. So highly encourage you if we could put Camino Financial's uh, social media on the chat and that way you have an additional resource to begin to build that relationship with. All right, let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, which is COVID. Um, how has the challenges and difficulties of COVID, everyone's talking about working from home, um, having your, your home office. Well, certainly that means, you know, for Matt, we're not going into Bank of America. So how does building a relationship, what are new strategies that you might recommend in this period where we might not have the same type of access to bankers uh, during a pandemic? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and go first, uh, Kenny, if that's okay. Um, I mean, I guess, first off, I mean, Bank of America is open. We're open for business. Our retail financial centers are there. You guys can see in my background uh, on the commercial banking side, our office is not open. So I'm at home constantly conducting similar uh, meetings like this, WebEx, Zoom, whatever it may be to s try to stay connected to our clients. Uh, so those resources are still available. But for the small business client, I mean, the financial centers are there. Um, because we brought up COVID, what I would ask of, of all the entrepreneurs out there is to not shy away from the difficulties that the business ran through during those times. You know, we understand how difficult it was and, and we hear the stories all the time, but we know there's a lot of pieces that are missing from there as well, right? It didn't just impact your employees, didn't just impact, you know, the size of your company, but it also hit home, right? I mean, it, it affected the way that many of our business owners were living day to day and, and trying to figure out how they were gonna get through that time. Uh, I believe between Kenny and I, you guys understand and enough has been shared that ultimately we're here to help, right? It's not from a banking standpoint, it's not about selling a loan or selling an account or, or looking at it that way. It's about helping you guys thrive. And I would say, you know, the bankers, I guess also when picking one should also make that very clear to you, right? We're trying to find a solution to help especially during these difficult times. Um, so share that information so we can look at what else might be out there. Um, I've had clients that come in and the business opportunity maybe wasn't there. Um, they couldn't support what they were looking to do. Um, but by having deeper conversations with them, there may have been other resources, assets that they have personally uh, that we were able to leverage that got them through the time, you know, such as equity lines of credit, cash out refinances, um, of their homes, refinancing auto loans, um, stuff like that. So again, the more transparency we have and the more information we can get, the better we can advise to what's gonna get you guys through this. Great. Um, Kenny, let's go to you. We talk, again, we talk about how, building this relationship before you actually need the capital. Mm -hmm. I wanna get from your perspective, 
what is the right time to pursue capital? When is the right time to go after capital? And how should an entrepreneur do so? Yeah, well, I, I, I tell people, I tell all the business owners and entrepreneurs that are looking for capital, there's really at the end of the day, one reason why you should access capital. And that is to make more money, right? I mean, I, I think the, the beauty of, of business is there's a bottom line at the end of the day that we have to meet. And, 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 and while um, Camino Financial itself is for profit, but a mission driven business, it's very important that we uh, make a profit for all our stakeholders, right? And so I, I think my point, I, I, when you know when it's the right time to ask for capital, when there's a very clear use case to use that capital. Now, I, th there's two very popular, so um, Jennifer was very good and kind enough to share with us the demographics and, and the business sizes of, of the audience. And what I've noticed is there's a good amount of businesses here that earn less than $1 million. And I think two use cases that I see with a lot of businesses that make less than $1 million in revenue is first working capital, right? Working capital effectively is relating to having cash in your bank account to operate. For example, if you are a general or even a subcontractor and you're doing a job, sometimes it takes your clients 30, 60, up to 90 days until they pay you back the not uh, to cover your supplies and of course for you to earn a profit so there's a gap between the amount that you're putting to work and the income that you receive from that customer so that's i think a very classic example of a working capital need for a small business right um i think the second use case which is pretty obvious is is when you have to buy um an asset or, or a piece of, for example, a piece of equipment. In fact, I would say in these cases, Bank of America is a incredible solution or another traditional lender or a bank is an incredible solution because they traditionally are secured lenders, although of course they offer unsecured capital as well. And so they're gonna give you a very good rate and also consider that when you're talking about a secured loan, this is where the SBA options are also a little bit more accessible to you as well. And so uh, so just in summary, make sure that you can make money with it. And the two popular uh, reasons are working capital and effectively a capital investment. Wonderful, thanks for sharing that. Um, I do have a few more questions for you before I open it, open up the questions to the audience. So for all of the, for all of you that are listening and you have questions for Matt or Kenny, please do put your questions in the chat. Um, Matt, I want to start with you. What suggestions do you have for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, as to how they can showcase themselves and their business for successful lending? What advice would you provide to them? Like I said in, in every response to my question, first and foremost, willingness to transparency, right? Don't don't go about it trying to hide something. Our job, well, let me take a step back. If you've ever applied for a credit card, an auto loan, or a home loan, it's pretty cut and dry the way that you apply. You have a FICA score, you have a uh, income ratio, and you pretty much get qualified. When it comes to business lending, so much is about the story one that the client can tell us, and then two, the way that the banker can share it with the risk, with the audit, uh, audit team, uh, with compliance, with credit. So the more of the story that we have, the better we can potentially mitigate what you may see as a concern, right? There might be a story behind why the profit looks the way it did. Well, the company did a $100,000 investment into a piece of equipment rather than financing it. Uh, which I guess takes me back to what Kenny was talking about as far as access to capital. When you know your, when you know the business and the growth trajectory, finance what you can, keep the cash on hand for what you can't. And some of those areas that you can't may be working capital to grow employees, you know, to expand into new markets. Um, but but that goes back again to the story. What happened? What, what was purchased? Why does the profit look the way that it does? And that's just one example of, of the information that can be very, very important to your business banker. Take the time to walk us through the last couple of years and what it was like, the goods, the bads, um, and also a little bit around what the trajectory looks like. You know, what's the expectation moving forward? Um, what are some of those expenses? 
that allows us to do our job. Great. Kenny, do you want to add, add to what Matt just shared? Uh, I mean, I, I think he nailed it. And uh, But in addition to transparency when uh, considering accessing capital, make sure everything's in order. And, and that also includes the details of the documentation. Um, I can tell you uh, when it, it breaks my heart, especially during COVID, when you're very far in the process, you ask for proof of business and the business registration has expired. And it's like, ooh, and then the offices are closed, but you really need that because, I mean, at the end of the day, we all, as lenders, typically we're lending, you know, we're working from a fund and there's a credit policy and we have to check certain boxes right and 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 so i just uh just keep in mind that attention to detail when it comes to just having your basic corporate documentation well in order um when it comes to uh get, getting ready for for applying for loan yes and i also in addition to the corporate documentation we talked in series in session two about the financial documentation and your financial records so for anybody that um maybe missed that please visit our youtube and, and take a look at that session we really highlighted the power of technology so that you can maintain accurate and timely financial records which is also a component that will come into the conversation with kenny and and matt so certainly uh, and a, a critical component of the lending process. All right, I do wanna go to a few questions from the audience and maybe I'll direct this one to Matt first. Uh, the question is, what advice can you provide for a borrower to secure the most competitive loan terms? Also, are there any negotiable clauses in the loan document that Latino or Latino borrowers typically oversee or overlook? I guess the, the second part of the question, I don't know if it would be typical just for uh, Latino or Hispanic borrowers to overlook some of the clauses in the loan documents, but that's something that, that should be read through very carefully and your banker should also be able to discuss with you, um, depending on what segment of the bank you're within or what type of lending product you're looking at, um, they can oftentimes be negotiated to a certain extent. Um, I could share with you on, on the commercial banking side, we do get into those discussions pretty regularly. Um, however, we also start off with reporting requirements that are a lot different than most small business um, loans. So have that conversation with your banker. They should be able to talk about it. And if they're not able to talk about it, they'll get you connected to the right people within the bank um, or at least relay the information, the request that you have. It definitely doesn't hurt to ask. When it comes to, to rates and terms um, and speaking on the most competitive there are often negotiations there, um, but as I said, in the approval process, how it differs from an auto loan or a home loan, the bank doesn't just look at the at the profits and say, hey, they made this much, they qualify for this much, here's your rate and term. There's an entire risk appetite depending on industry, history of, of working, um, history of the owners that goes into factor. Um, so. I guess what I'm getting at is you can have two business owners with the same amount of profits, same loan requests, but both applying for the same thing. Their rates and and um, terms may look different. Doesn't mean one got a better deal than the other because of some reason. It's there's a factor of risk that the bank has to consider, and that's a that's a part that may not be shared with many business owners. So additional insight to you guys on how we do our process. I'd like to chime in there as well, uh, if that's okay. I, on, on the first part of the question related to, um, you know, trying to negotiate more competitive terms, I, I think um, one piece of advice is if you're asking for more competitive terms, just be prepared to offer more information. <laughs> because the more information that helps us tell a better story to our underwriters who we try to hire the most conservative people out there that, you know, can catch risk. I mean, just kidding. But the reality is we want, I mean, they want to lend and, and capitalize. But the point is uh, they're trained to be, to, to understand businesses. And if we can offer more information that basically says, hey, this is not at this risk level. It's at, you know, it's at a lower risk level. Then you can get longer term loans. You can get a lower rate. Um, and uh, in terms of some of the uh, so the, the terms to consider in a loan document, I mean, Matt mentioned it perfectly. It really just depends on uh, 
you know, the size of the loan you're getting. Um, it also depends on the lender. I mean, full transparency at Camino Financial as a fintech, since we're more streamlined, the, the, the loan contract is, is standard. It's a, it's a standard loan contract. Um, I, I, and uh, because we do smaller loan sizes, we, our average ticket size is about $17,000. Uh, so we have to streamline it in order for us to scale our model. Uh, but uh, of course, if you're doing two, three, ten million dollar loans or multi million dollar loans, there's a lot more negotiation that goes into it. I think in the context of this audience, I, 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 in terms of loans, I think a lot of borrowers tend to fixate on the interest rate, consider prepayment penalties on that loan. Um, uh, consider just overall the term of the loan that impacts a lot your payments uh, that you have, right? Because at the end of the day, you really want to focus on the that you can, the affordability. Can you actually make that payment comfortably? What day are the, is the does the payment cycle fall on? For example, I mean, again, we we're talking about working capital. Every business is different. You may not want to be part of on the twenty fifth payment cycle. You may be want to be on 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 the fifth payment side with the fifth of the month, that's when you know you have the money in your bank account so that you don't trigger a default, right? Um, I think these are some nuances. And the lastly, if you're over a million dollars, you're looking for a larger loan size. I mean, in my private equity days, when I used to negotiate contracts with, with guys like Matt, I'd pay a lot of attention to the covenants. Covenants effectively can be triggered and can, um, they protect the lender from you doing certain things as a business owner, but you also have to make sure that whatever that covenant is doesn't um, aligns with your plan, right? <laughs> your investment plans. An example of a covenant is, hey, you can't invest more than this amount of money in a certain period of time. Well, if you're planning to ex you know, aggressively expand stores because you're a retailer and you can't open more than two stores in a year, that's a problem, right? So these are the things that you need to negotiate to make sure that not only the loan terms make sense for you, but that those covenants don't um, don't uh, don't don't you know don't remove the flexibility you may need to hit your plan. This is really great information um, from both of you. Thank you. What I am hearing, what both of you have said, is transparency. Be transparent about your business so that we can help you. Uh, come to those favorable and competitive terms. I wanna ask, and maybe I'll direct this one to Kenny. Kenny, you might know that within our culture, we might keep things a little close to the chest, specifically when it comes to uh, financial information, we might still mm -hmm. have our savings underneath our colchon. What would you say to these business owners who um, are just not as transparent as, as they could be? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just participated in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another amazing panel uh, earlier today and with the LA Chamber. And one of the panelists said something, you, you need to make a decision when it comes to financial reporting and transparency. Are you running a business to save on taxes or are you running a business to build wealth, okay? And uh, an amazing book that I really encourage you guys to read is uh, Sam Walton's book about um, Built for America, it's his autobiography. And I mean, Walmart, he's the founder of Walmart and they use debt. Um, Walt Disney, Bank of America was their lender. That's how they that, that that's how they, they built that empire. Capital can really unlock a ton of wealth within your company. And if you want to go, and if, and by the way, it's okay if you want to just kind of run a relatively small business, save on taxes, run it informally, pass it through the family. That's totally cool. I'm not passing judgment, but just keep in mind that will limit what you have access to. And so that's really a philosophical question you need to ask yourself. If you want to build wealth for yourself, for your family, for your community, I mean, I, you really have to um, effectively step out of the shadows and start, you know, having one set of numbers. And so you can control those set of numbers and build on them. And, uh, and, and, and what I would say is, um, like, is there are lenders like Amino Financial that are really built to be a great stepping stone for you. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first one to say that Camino Financial will not be your cheapest op option. Typically, the cheapest option is a, a loan offer guaranteed by the government, the SBA, Small Business Administration. If you can graduate to that, I really that, that should be the goal. 
of any business owner looking to, to, to get some debt financing. But I do think uh, fintechs like Camino Financial offer a tremendous stepping stone because although we will, uh, we, we, we focus mainly on cash flow data and we don't look at tax returns. And the way we access those, that, that cash flow data is through your, your banking transactions. Um, we use a third party called Plaid and we download the last six months of bank transaction data. We run it through our model and we actually guesstimate what the income is. <laughs> because if we didn't guess, uh, we wouldn't be lending to many Latinos, unfortunately. And so after that, we give an incentive to, after every nine months, we're like, we can offer more capital, right? We can lower the costs, but we need more transparency, right? So that's really how Camino Financial is structured. Um, we kind of, in some ways, gamify the process a little bit uh, to give you at least a starting point and then a, and then a Camino, effectively, a path to um, to formalize your business and build wealth. Great, thank you for sharing that perspective. I think it uh, it's really important to reiterate and underscore that there there is two different mindsets. If you are building wealth or if you are um, running a business to have the most favorable tax return. So thank you for for being transparent with that, Kenny. Uh, Matt, let's go to you. There's another question here. You know, with the question is that, you know, with the pandemic, some banks have less employees um, and the service might not be the same. And the relationship with the banker might be a little bit more different. How how do you see that in Bank of America um, with with the pandemic and the challenges of the pandemic? I mean, just we we're all business owners here. Everyone's running a business. Uh, so I think you guys can all relate. I mean, there were a number of restrictions across the board from number of people allowed in the centers um, to, you know, potential, uh, what was it, COVID outbreaks or, or um, you know, somebody getting sick in there that required the, the branches, uh, financial centers to shut down. And I do know that we did our best as early as we could to make ourselves as accessible as possible. Um, but just like the rest of you, we were all hit with it. Um, you know, we're starting to turn a corner. We're seeing shorter wait times. We're seeing more people available there, and it's going to continue to move up, move up that way. Um, although I don't work in the financial centers, I, I was told of either a pilot or um, an attempt to be able to offer uh, video um, meetings as well. So I believe through bankofamerica.com, you can schedule an appointment and in select areas if it is still in pilot mode you should be able to schedule appointments just like this over zoom or or webex um, so we've invested heavily in technology to try to make ourselves as accessible as possible but i do understand the frustrations around that you know we were all impacted by it certainly and i i just love the the pivot right even big institutions large institutions like bank of america needs to pivot um, as the whole world did in 2020 and even beyond. We have another question for the audience from the audience here. Um, is it possible? And if so, how do we, how does a small business owner manage a relationship with more than one lender for different financing needs? And I'll yeah. let either of you take that question. I, I, I saw that question. I, I, I really wanted to jump on it. I, I think it's, it's a fantastic question. I mean, first of all, it's okay to have multiple relationships in many ways. I mean, you actually get credit on FICO for having multiple relationships, um, but you have to be in good standing with those relationships. So one of the common, let me start with the common pitfall that I really want to make sure is the main point here. Um, be careful with what a concept called loan stacking, right? Um, that means uh, you want to grow aggressively and you're just getting loans from a lot of different sources without the lenders communicating, okay? Uh, the and the issue with that is one you're over you may be over leveraging yourself remember the creditor is here to keep you honest as well I, I hope you don't see us so much as the villain we, we if we say no it's it's para tu bien it's for your own good okay <laughs> because we honestly don't want you to over lever right I mean and and, and trust me Camino Financial is relatively you know relative to other lenders you know we're, we we can take risk and so uh, I think just be careful with loans with loan stacking, basically just really just going with multiple lenders um, without really consulting them. And really the, 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 the piece of advice is um, I think before you go to another lender, 
Um, if, for example, if you're working with Camino Financial, talk to your, in, in, in the case of Camino Financial, you will have an account executive that is assigned to your account forever. Um, and uh, you give them a call and say, hey, look, uh, I'm looking to get some invoice financing. That's the receivables cash flow. Um, so invoice financing is a way to finance your your the the invoices that customers owe you. So if customers owe you money, you can you can finance that. And so uh, you know we'll help you think through it, and may even recommend you uh, uh, an invoice financing company that we work with, right? And so I think you know think think about the the core relationship that you have, whether that's with Bank of America, with uh, Camino Financial, and of course, at the end of the day, it's with an account executive, somebody that really understands your business. Talk to them about it because they may be able to offer you additional capital to satisfy that need, or they will refer you to someone, or if they can't refer you to something, at least they're in the know and, uh, and they give you their blessing. They're like, hey, good luck. Go ahead and do what you got to do. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that it's it, it, going back to transparency, 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 I think is, is important. Great. Uh, I'd like to add to that a little bit. Um, what Kenny had shared earlier, uh, Camino Financial is oftentimes used as a stepping stone to more traditional or conventional, uh, lending, um, you know, within, with an institution like Bank of America. When you graduate from Camino Financial or, or a similar lender, um, it may not benefit you to have multiple lenders. You know, you have Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase. You may want to have that conversation with the preferred lender because we do look at a total relationship. We might be able to get more competitive when we have the full relationship. And I'm talking your, your operating accounts, um, your line of credit, your equipment financing, and your real estate. Bring it all into one place and, and allow us the opportunity to build an entire package and solution against that, right? Um, I, I think it would more than likely work in your favor um, to have one lender um, once you've graduated from a place like Camino Financial to really look at the whole deal. And now there's just a, a follow-up question that came in around that. How does having your business um, finances at a, at a lender as well as personal, does, does the personal component come in and play a factor as well? We look at full relationship. Right. I, I can't say that you have a home loan with us so I can give better pricing on on a on a business line of credit. Right. Um, but we do look at the total relationship and there is value to having it within our house. When I go through an approval process and I'm talking to credit and risk, like I shared earlier on, I do my profile on my story and it includes what's going on with the individuals. So it is highlighted. You know, it is there and it is a consideration um, because, quite honestly, it could be an opportunity to grow that personal relationship with ultimately helps the institution, but it could also be an opportunity to lose it, right? Um, if, we're, if we're not being competitive and, and that's not the way that we wanna go. We wanna take somebody from their student checking account, you know, through their retirement and, and into their estate and trust planning um, and everything in between, whatever's going on. So I, I would say it, it will benefit you, um, but it's not gonna look like a, 20 basis point discount on a line of credit right off the bat. Great, thank you. I, I just wanna say thank you to both of you. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, such, uh, you two have been very transparent and I think the theme of today's conversation is that as we think about building a relationship with a lender, we're gonna lead with transparency. So again, thank you for all the insight uh, that you shared, your experience that you shared. I know that there's been a couple people who have asked for your contact information. Um, so if you're um, willing to put your information or maybe your organization's uh, contact information, that would be great. If our, our audience can just join me in sharing their appreciation in the chat, I wanna just give a round of applause to Matt and Kenny. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing all that you did today. We appreciate it. It's all been right. my pleasure. Thank you. Great. At this point, I want to transition and I want to introduce to you my colleague, Elian Sivadifkar. He is the Director of Engagement in Elban. He has been with the organization uh, for nearly three years now. He leads uh, many different initiatives within the organization, but he certainly leads our capital initiative. And so, Elian, if you can join me on stage here. 
Um, what a fantastic team he team member he is. It's just a pleasure to work with him. I want to pass the stage to him as he's going to facilitate the next portion of our session. So thank you, Elian. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And if we can all give her a big virtual round of applause to Jennifer for leading that panel. A lot of great information. And we're going to keep going. We're going to be talking about one pager and I'm, I'm going to bring out Lawrence Chavez in a second who's going to help us work through this exercise. So this is an exercise that is going to help you really talk about your business and put a lot of the different parts of your business in context when it comes to lending and also when it comes to talking to external parties about your business. So we're going to work with that in a second. Um, looking forward to, to speaking with Lawrence. We have such a great crowd. So I want you to stick around and after we'll have some networking as well. So there is a lot going on today. Um, I wanna bring up Lawrence up to, to the stage and a little information about Lawrence. He is a passionate innovator focused on meaningful innovation. And, and that is very true to him and his work. He is the CEO and founder of Everyday Contacts. And previously before Everyday Contacts, Lawrence co-founded Lotus Leaf Coatings an advanced materials company in 2011. And prior to 2011, he served as a venture partner with Flyvio Ventures and served as interim CFO at Astria Semiconductor. Lawrence has been on both sides of the table and understand the needs of the investor and the requirement of the founder. Lawrence, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful today. Thank you very much, Elian. Excited to be here. Thank you uh, all for participating. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Absolutely. And it is it is our pleasure to have you with us. You go over this assignment with our scaling program. So it is fantastic to be able to transfer that to this event here. Um, I know we're going to be sharing our screen and showcasing what that one pager looks like. Just to give everybody some information on, on how this event is going to go, Lawrence and I are going to show the one pager, which we're going to put in the chat. You can download a pre-made sample. And so the sample is going to go through some of the, the topics that we're going to talk about today with Lawrence. And what we want you to do is obviously take notes during this, but then after this webinar, go ahead and spend the time to work on this yourself. One of the things that we do in our scaling program is that we have our entrepreneurs listen to Lawrence, go through this exercise, ask questions, and then go and do this exercise themselves. And then we give feedback. This is an assignment that is, is incredible for the business owner to be able to leverage their business and be able to talk about their business. Um, and so you'll see that sample on the chat. You can also go through our options on the web platform or on the app if you are listening to us on the app and you can download it straight from the Socio app, but we'll be sharing that, uh, that messaging, that Google Drive where you can download it. And so, Lawrence, do you want to go ahead and share a screen or, or do you want me to share the, the sample document? So if you have it up, go ahead and do that. So OK, great. So I'm going to be showcasing that in a second. But just give us a little perspective about, about what the document means and, and why this is an important document um, for companies to prepare for small business owners, whether you're making 100,000 or a million or five million. Why is this an important document for any business owner? So the reason it's an important document, I remember when I first started doing this stuff, everybody said you had to have a business plan. Uh, but nobody ever read the business plan. And so essentially the problem with a, you can, you should have a business plan or at least all the details that go into it. But to be clear, most people aren't going to look at that. They're not going to spend the time and effort to do that. A one pager is a very succinct, succinct, direct document that allows you to convey the important factors of your business to the audience that you're communicating with. Most of the time, the one pager is meant for a capital raise. So that audience could be an investor, it could be a banker, or it could be some other service provider that you're working with. So the one pager is what I would call a marketing document that ena enables you to outline your business so that you can have a next discussion. You're not trying to answer all the questions. You're trying to get to whatever that next discussion is. And that depends on your audience. That's great, Lawrence. And I am uh, sharing my screen right now so everybody can see this document. Um, and, and I'll start with the first question, which is the way that the layout is seen, which is um, when we say one page, does it necessarily have to be just one page? No, it can be two pages. Uh, anything more than two pages is a little overkill, um, but uh, two pages is more than sufficient. Uh, one page is sometimes too tight uh, to, to be able to handle 
the detail that you have to put in there. And to be clear, when I'm talking about detail, I'm talking about a very succinct statement about what each one of these items are. Absolutely. And for everyone listening here, you know, please show us your questions as we go through this one pager. Um, myself and Lawrence, we go through a lot of these one pagers to give feedback, to really listen about what companies are sharing. And so I want to start with the top, which is a very simple logo and two line description. Can you share with me why it's important, um, especially on the design side, that, that logo? What what do you think goes through and, and why is this an important part of, of the one pager to start with? So part of the reason you do the one pager, uh, as we mentioned, it's to get to the next discussion, but it's also to demonstrate that you're a thoughtful uh, business with some type of credibility. In essence, this document is providing credibility from you, transferring credibility from you to the audience. And the logo is important in that it shows that you've spent some time thinking about who you are, how you want to present yourself. And so when you think about the, the logo, if you have one, put it up here, make sure it's something that's not too busy, but that you've thought through so the audience knows your real business. It's amazing how much just a logo can have people look at you differently than, than nothing, so. Yeah, and, and to follow up on that, I think we all know, right? Like first impressions is so key. And the way that something looks, if it looks professional, you're willing to spend a little bit more time. And I love your comment about this is really to help you get to that next level, right? You want, this is almost like this, the appetizer. If you go to a restaurant, you want people to stick around for, for the other dishes. You want this plate to really be able to showcase you. And it starts with that logo. It starts with that two line description to give people that ability to really stick around and want to be vested in, in listening to the rest of uh, what you're doing. So I, the first two things that you see after that, the problem and solution, this is something that we see a lot of issues with um, when it comes to entrepreneurs talking about their business. And I actually think this is something that is not just for the one pager, but just in your everyday sort of conversation, right? A lot of people call it the elevator pitch when you meet somebody in an elevator, but I think it's just the way you talk about your business in general. What, what do you think people should be putting here and what are the issues that you normally see when it comes to the problem and solution? So I'll, I'll start with the issues first. And one of the issues that we typically see is that people talk about themselves. The wonderful thing about the problem solution statement is that it automatically focuses or should focus on your customer. What problem does your customer have and what solution are you providing for that customer? And all too often in the problem statement or the solution statement, we hear what the company does, but it's unrelated to a specific problem. And I, what I mean by it's un, not a, it's unrelated, it may be related to a problem. It's just that when you're, as an audience member reading the description, you don't know that it's related. Um, so when you're describing a problem, put yourself in the shoes of your customer. You could even use a you know very succinct customer example. You don't have to say Sally or Bob, but you know uh, we're solving the problem of this type of customer because the existing uh, solutions are limited, and then whatever their limitations are, or whatever problems Sally and Bob are having. And then when you describe the solution, describe it from the perspective of the customer, not from the solution, that, not from how you're, you're um, not from what you're doing. And that's important because all too often, particularly if you're very, this is something that you're very passionate about, you look at the description. So if, if you're providing a technical solution, you'll go into the technology of what you're doing. That's important, no doubt, but it's unrelated to the solution. The solution directly relates to the problem. Absolutely. And one thing that I always like to talk about here is emotions important, right? And when we go see a movie, a lot of us prefer to watch uh, an action movie rather than a documentary. Documentary might be a lot more factual based, which is great. But maybe when you when you really want people to stick around, a lot of times that story is really the key part. And even with documentaries, that story is key to making people listen to a lot of the facts. So in this problem and solution, I always recommend to companies showcase that emotion of solving the problem. What is that customer going through that's such a big issue? And why is your solution the one that fixes that emotional issue? Um, COVID has really been something that I think with the why now, Right? A lot of companies can talk about, hey, my business is in the right moment right now because with COVID, XYZ has happened. 
um, or maybe just something that has happened culturally has made this product really relevant, why now? What are your thoughts around how companies should describe that why now moment? So the why now should be related specifically to why this point in time is important to the solution that you're providing. Uh, and as you mentioned, you, it, it's amazing that once COVID hit, how many people have pivoted uh, their business models to do certain things to solve COVID, which is great. We needed that. At that point in time, we needed it. So the why now was very descriptive. Um, and make sure you think about it as it relates to your solution. So, uh, you know, the why now uh, for what we're doing at Everyday Contacts, just uh, we're doing what we call, we're introducing a new contact lens through a doctor enabled direct consumer model. So for us, the impact of COVID, the why now is that there's a, the shift that was already happening to online contact lenses has, was, has been accelerated due to COVID. And so our why now is part of that. Uh, if you were doing, you know, a um, MP3 player back in the early 2000s, the shift of people's behavior, that's the why now. If you try to do an MP3 player in 2020, um, you, you, there is no why now there. So the why now is important and you need to think about how you fit into that dynamic. Absolutely. And I think for a lot of the businesses that are listening to us right now, you might be going through a pivot that was caused by COVID. Right? Maybe you were selling coffee beans um, just in a brick and mortar store or to businesses, and now you've pivoted to selling them online. That why now moment, right? More people are switching to buying online because of COVID, because of that preference. So as we look for capital to build our e-commerce store, why now? Now is the moment. So there's definitely things that are happening in the moment that might cause a pivot or just your business in general is structured to take advantage of things that are happening right now. Um, Market size is so key, and especially as you start talking to potential investors, what are your thoughts around market size and, and what are the problems that you see there? And, and also, I, I see two words that might cause a hip, hiccup for companies, which is top down and bottom up. Can you just talk to us about what that means? So, I uh, will. I'm going to back up to the why now, real quick, if you don't, don't mind me. So, yeah, yeah. So, the why now. Um, there are a gazillion reasons for why now, and I want to give kudos. There was one of the one pagers from this Stanford program that had a sustainability why now. And for them, their sustainability why now was beautiful. It related to you know, the, the problems with the existing process and how their uh, solution was important. And so their why now was very clear and concise. And so the why now um, could be cultural. It doesn't have to be market. Um, it could be societal. It could be a gazillion different why nows, but it has to be relevant. And so I wanted to touch base on that. Yeah. And can I actually, can I stop before we go market size? You said two words that I think are key in this exercise, which is clear and concise. Um, when, when we're business owners, we oftentimes talk about our business all the time. And in our head, we know what our business is. We know what our value proposition is. We know all of the different parts of our businesses. And a lot of times when we communicate that, we communicate it as if somebody knows what we're talking about. I think one of the key things about this exercise, and, and Lawrence, maybe you can also share your thoughts, is rewriting it over and over again so that somebody else at, at a fifth grade level or whatever level they're at can understand what your business is doing in every part of that. Being clear and concise, I think, is a key part of, of what this exercise brings to you and your business, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we've done this the past couple of years during during this the Slay program. We've done this through Gust, and I know we didn't do it this time because there were some changes in the Gust platform. But the wonderful thing about the Gust platform is you had a limited um, limited characters. So when your description of the why now, you had to do it within 250 characters. The market size had to be 300 characters. Or the, the size of the fields were a little bit different. So it limited your responses, which made you really think about how clear and concise you had to be. And so that was one of the things I loved about the Gust platform. It has its challenges. Overall, it was very good. But I would encourage you to think about how you can limit uh, your answers, because it causes you to iterate, and it also causes you to go back and reread what you wrote, and think through how you said it. Because it's amazing how much, and and I'm horrible at this as well, is where you will say something and you've said it in a very wordy, non-concise way, and then you kind of restate it in another way in the second or third sentence. 
And by limiting your characters, you are enabling yourself to do the clear and concise method. And you have to remember that when your audience, typically if it's bankers or investors are reading this, they're reading a hundred other of these a day. And so your ability to cut through that um, minutia and be clear and succinct to the point will get you to the top of the pile. And really, it, it will. You'll be able to cut through. And if they can understand your what you're doing, if the first three parts of your um, your statement, your your two two line sentences sentence, your problem and your solution statement are crystal clear, you've already separated yourself from nine nine out of 10 people have submitted a document like this. Absolutely. Great conversation here about one pagers, how to talk about your business, both externally, internally, how to really be concise. And especially when it comes to lending market size, a big question mark for a lot of businesses. Um, and this, I think this area is probably the area where people might speak a little bit more or might write a little bit more, um, what are some of the issues or, or what do you see within the market size that, that you would recommend to people? So the market size, the couple of things I'd like to, to, to encourage you on your market size, focus on your market size. Uh, so um, I'll give you a simple example. If you are doing a new um, travel bag um, that's, you know, some fashionable bag or has some, you know, built in battery, whatever the case may be. Um, I've actually seen people put in the entire travel market size. So the travel market is a $300 billion market and um, we're going to address that market. That's not your market. Your market is the travel bag market, whatever that may be. And it may take a little bit of effort to get that information. You may need to have to go to some industry organizations. You may have to do some calculation in order to get that. So sometimes it's hard to get those numbers, but the, the clarity and succinctness of your one pager, if your market size is not correct, then what's, what's gonna happen is the rest of the, your numbers and rest of your information is gonna be suspect. So make sure everything is, fits within, your, within what you're working on. So that's one yeah. of the things. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I like to talk to small businesses or regional businesses about is kind of that same point, right? If you're based in Sonoma, your market size is there, right? How many people, if you have a restaurant, how many people are going to go to that restaurant within the Sonoma area? Your market size is not just people in California, but it's people in the Sonoma. How many tourists are coming? How many people are going to be in that area? Um, the other thing that I, I really sort of recommend to, to entrepreneurs is put a value to it. And, and I think this is where maybe some people kind of trip up, which is how do I value the sort of the value of that market size, right? If it is a restaurant in Sonoma County, how do I put a value on what is in that market? Um, what are your thoughts around the, the value of a market size? So the, it, that's important. Um, it's important for both a debt investing. It's even more important for uh, equity investors that are you're raising money from. But putting a number on that's important. And that's where I'm saying is you typically can't just go on the internet and pull off a market size. Sometimes you can, but um, it may be something to use the, the restaurant in Sonoma Valley. Um, you can probably figure out that uh, the market size for all restaurants in the United States is, I don't know, 300 billion, I'm using that number. And Sonoma Valley, or at least your region of what you're serving, has one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population in the United States. So you can just do the very quick math and say, what is your market size of that 300 billion? So you can come to those numbers with a couple of little quick calculations. And the reason that's important is that's defensible, is that you're just not throwing out a number. If somebody asks you, how do you come up with this market size? You can say, well, I did this, took the total market size of all restaurants, took the population of Sonoma Valley as a proportion of the total population in the United States, and there's my market size. Um, and, you know, those defensible, justifiable numbers are very critical when you get, start getting those questions from either the debt provider or the investor that's reviewing the document. Yeah, and I, I want to say, so we, we could spend a whole day talking about market size, and, and there's a lot of different things that we can talk here. We, we do need to move on in time's sake, but definitely recommend 
you know, really understanding your market size. And especially if you're looking to expand into other regions, those are the things that lenders really want to hear about. What is the value of those markets that you're expanding to? Um, with that, I want to move into competition and differentiation because, oh, okay. go ahead. One more thing. Just, I want to mention top down, bottom up, uh, yeah. contrary. For debt investors, um, I haven't heard a lot, lot of issues with the top down. But for equity investors, if you're looking for someone to put money in and buy shares of your company, top down is not very well appreciated. It's You really have to think through the bottom up of how you can calculate what your market opportunity is on a customer by customer or transaction by transaction basis. Because if you haven't thought through that, you're going to get dinged a lot by an equity investor. Absolutely. Okay. No, fantastic. And talking about competition and differentiation, I love the the line that the sample uses, which is like, please don't say you don't have any competition. It's one of my pet peeves is when people say we're, we're, the, we're the only ones out there. Um, what I always like to reference here is what is your customer currently using? Right? It might not be necessarily what you're creating, but they're, they're solving their problem with something out there right now. That's your competition. Um, and, and, and that might be something different, right? It might be Hey, you're making a car company. They might be using a bicycle, right? But what, maybe not the best example, but what are your thoughts around how people should phrase that competition? And what do you say to those people that say, we don't have a competition or we have every competitor out there, right? I've also seen that where people say, um, everyone out there is our competitor. What are, what are your thoughts there? Well, in both cases, you, that just means you haven't thought through it very deeply. Um, and I mean that sincerely. Um, even the most dynamically unique item that ever existed in the world has a singular, probably the biggest inertia of competition, which is the fact that some people have a choice of doing nothing. Um, so you always have competition, even if it's nothing else out there. And again, everybody else, we're always building something on the shoulders of other people that have come before us. So there always is competition. There's variations upon a theme. There's always people out there doing what we're doing. So think about those people, break down your business model or your technology or your product or whatever the case may be into components to think about how do you compete with one person here versus this other factor? And then you can list those people because essentially if it just use contact lens market as an example, um, there's nobody doing exactly what we're doing, but there's people doing different parts of it. And we're just doing a unique aggregation of a direct consumer model with a uh, doctor offered contact lens. So our offering is unique in itself but there are alternatives all along the way that we have to deal with. And so we can talk about our competitions in each one of that categories. So you could say, we have a competition who offer this part of our service. We have competition who offers this part of our service. And we differentiate ourselves from each one of those because by offering both of those services together, the, the customer gets a better, quicker return or they get better service or higher download speeds or whatever the case may be. But you can talk through the differentiation and how you match up with the competition. So, Absolutely. And just to quickly touch up on differentiation, um, earlier in the panel when we heard uh, Kenny Salas from Camino Financial, they have a really big differentiation, which is they're Latinos. Their content's in Spanish. They know the culture. Uh, even things like that, where it's like, hey, we offer services in Spanish, right? Well, maybe your customer base, your market size is that Latino market, then you have a huge differentiation. So sometimes it's the little things in your team or the little things within ourselves in our culture that enable us to have a big differentiation that our competition doesn't have. I want to move on. I know we're, we're running a little bit on, short on time, but we have a couple things to get to. And I want to talk about that business model, because this is also an area where I feel some people do get caught up on, um, but are you direct to consumer? Are you business to business? Are you a marketplace? This is really an area for you to tell us, how are you getting your revenue? Um, just want to get some quick thoughts on you, Lawrence, with this, with this topic. So the business model, the quick way uh, is to use a customer example or, you know, if you sell a product. If you do sell a product, how much is it? If it's, uh, how much do you make on it? Uh, how often do you sell it? And the the conciseness of this is important. So you could say, we sell a product, it's a monthly subscription, it's $50 a month. 
uh, our cost of goods sold is, you know, $25 a month. Um, and we will sell um, X number per, per year based upon whatever, whatever relationships that we have. So you very quickly, you can describe to um, your audience uh, how you make money. And it even actually helps support your market opportunity when you do your market size, particularly if you describe, that's why I'm saying if you do a bottom is up description and your market opportunity, and then you do your business model, your audience can get a very good idea of what type of revenue you can generate, how it works and those type of things. So you can allow these different categories to work together by thinking of, okay, I said my bottoms up strategy is to secure, use the restaurant in Sonoma, um, that uh, we're going to do um, a, you know, we know that, that we can make an offering through um, a partner relationship to um, businesses that want to do uh, catering. And so we can, you get a hundred customers through that. Um, and then in your business model, the average, uh, the average meal that we'll sell through that relationship is $50 per meal. And so you can play those numbers together so that your audience can get an idea. And I know I did a horrible example because now you're talking about a $5,000 business, but you know my point. So, yeah. No, absolutely. I think this is a great area to to just talk about what your revenue model is. I want to get to something that's really important, which is team. And this is something, if you're in a high growth tech company, this is really key. Um, we talk about two, two short bios maximum, and it's okay to have a CEO. What I always like to see here is two team members. And usually, obviously, the CEO, the person running it, that's key. But then who is the second person that that is key to the business. So for a high growth tech company, it's gonna be your CTO, right? Because it, it's usually a technology company. You wanna have the person that's doing the coding that's that's really integral to, to the business. It's really integral to the business. Um, but let's go back to that example of a restaurant. So in a restaurant, you're gonna have the CEO and then you can either go with like, let's say the main chef. But what I always like to say is like, who's the operations person? Who is that COO? Who's the person that's gonna make that restaurant run clockwork, right? Just run like a clock smoothly because in a restaurant, that's that's going to be your key, right? Are you able to turn your customers? Are you able to have them come back? Operation is a key part of that. So if you are a business owner, who's that secondary person apart from you that's making your business run like a clock? Um, your thoughts, Lawrence? So I, I, would, I would agree with that. Who's critical to making sure, again, all these tie in together. So who's critical to making sure that you can deliver that solution uh, to the customer uh, above and beyond you. What what's uh, and it could be a differentiation. So um, if it is someone, so use the restaurant for example. It's someone who operated, you know, five five star restaurants in San Francisco, and now they're in Sonoma Valley, um, and they they're your operations person. That's the person you want there. Um, so it, it depends on. Um, what you're offering and who's important, but you know, that person is going to help deliver that solution statement. Yeah. And, and Lawrence here, I just want to go back to you for everyday context. Who's your one, two. So our one, two, it, it has always been, it, and again, it, I haven't been using this. So usually I have three, uh, but it's been our technical. And then we have a uh, contractor who's not an employee, but he's the person with the contact lens experience you know, has you know, 35 years of contact lens experience. So we have this combination of the the technology um, and then also the contact lens experience. And for us, we've needed that, that extra person because it provides us that credibility within the contact lens community for us. So um, yeah. before we go on to the financial, do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. I'll stop sharing and you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Um, okay, maybe it's not letting me, uh, there we go. It's actually it's asking me to share something that, is it uh, sharing? No, not yet, but it okay. does take a second. Because I've, I haven't used this platform before. Okay. So. Do you see the one pager? No, it's not on there yet. Okay. It's not allowing me to share here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to not share. So okay. I'll go back to sharing my screen. 
Um, so all, all I was going to do is on on the I have a as I mentioned we've done guest before I had a guest up uh, that we had and basically the if you have a chance go log on to guest the financial overview the the way they do it it's a very clean descriptive five year forecast with a key metrics uh, revenue and expenses so it actually helps uh, make a clear delineation. Um, so on the financial overview, it's very helpful to break that five-year forecast out in a very simplistic way. So, uh, and then the other important aspect of that is what is your ask? Are you raising, if you're raising debt, we're looking for a $200,000 loan, or if you're raising equity, we're raising $200,000 in equity. So, yeah, I, I want to just mention here because this, um, uh, this is probably one of the areas that Latino owned businesses struggle the most with, which is financials. Um, it, transparency is key here, right? But understanding your numbers, you need to know what EBITDA is. You need to know what your gross margin is. You need to know what your revenue is. Those three numbers right there are key to your business. And especially as you go start talking to lenders, um, if you do not know those, you need to go and talk to your accountant. If your accountant can't bring those up, you need to have that time where you work with your accountant or your, your bookkeeper and figure those things out because every lender out there is going to immediately ask you for those things and you should know those. So we, we start there with those three things, the revenue, the gross margin, the EBITDA, and then have that five-year projection. That's key. I, I was actually just watching Jeff Bezos this morning on a video where he talked about um, when they congratulate their team on a quarter, a really good quarter, he talks about how that quarter was actually talked about and strategized three years ago, right? You want to have those projections and maybe they're not going to be as detailed as Amazon does a three-year projection, but you want to at least start to think about what do I want the financials to look like in three years, in five years, especially as you start talking to lenders. And then for that final piece, that ask, that ask is key. Break it down, right? You're asking for a hundred thousand. 25 is going to go here. 25 is going to go there. Why is it key that that money goes into those places? How is that money going to help you get to those projections? Um, if you're going to spend a lot of time somewhere, spend it on the financial overview because it is an area that's key to you as, an, as, as a company internally, but also when you go and talk to your lender. Um, any last thoughts on this financial overview piece? So we, again, back to clear and concise, know your numbers. Um, and that's a challenge for a lot of business owners. They know their business, but they don't know their numbers. Uh, so be able to talk about these in a very clear, uh, simple way. Great. Well, we have we have a question. Um, somebody somebody answered in the chat, but I also want to get your thoughts on it. Um, Robert Sanchez said we are distinct by by having two different businesses: a manufacturing and distribution. Should each be highlighted? So. That's the question would be followed up with a question is who is the customer um, and is your distribution or is your manufacturer solely supporting your distribution and therefore um, there is no you're not selling to other people. So look at it from the customer standpoint. And if you have two customers, then, yes, you you might have to even do two different one pagers, actually. Um, or you could break down that the, we solved the solution on the manufacturing side for customer X uh, and we solved the solution on the distribution side for customer Y. Um, because, again, if you're vertically integrated, then your manufacturing feeds in your distribution and whoever is your distribution customer would be your customer. So I don't really know the, the answer there, but look at it from the eyes of your consumer, uh, sorry, your customer and an answer from that. If they're two different customers. If so, then you might have to do uh, break it out into two. That's great. Lawrence, our, our time is up. I want to do a quick summary and then get Jennifer back up. Um, before we do that, I want to have Marianne put in the chat the link so that people can download this sample document. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Again, it's a short version. We're doing 40 minutes here. We could really spend uh, a weekend doing all of this. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight here is this one pager document, I've heard from entrepreneurs that they they sort of fold it up and put it in their wallet and carry it everywhere. Um, this is the type of, do type of document that this is where you always want to have it ready. You want to internalize it because this is how you talk about your business. This is really the way that you internalize the different departments and the different things that you do in your business. So um, I want to I give a big thanks to Lawrence and, and I want to sign off with, 
Lawrence, what's your final feedback or final thing that you want to tell people about this one pager and, and about the lending environment? So the final thoughts on this, this is a living document. This is, yes, you can fold it up and put it in your, in your wallet or your, your pocket, but it's a living document and take it, get feedback on it and iterate on it. If you're on your fifth iteration, you're probably 10 iterations away from actually being clear and concise. Uh, the term that uh, I love that, that we used to use is getting to the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Everything that we do has multiple layers of complexity. Your job in communicating it to the lender or the investor is to make it appear simple. And if you can do that, then you set yourself apart from 99 out of 100 people. And when you do that, it makes a world of difference in your ability to raise capital. Absolutely. Lawrence, uh, I want everybody here to give a virtual round of applause. Lawrence, thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Ian. Great work and uh, definitely Everyday Contacts, fantastic company. So everyone should be following that as well. Thank you, Lawrence, for your work. And with that, um, I want to bring up Jennifer Garcia. Awesome. Well, thank you, Elian. Thank you, Lawrence. I really want to draw the connections between the panel discussion and then the chat that we just heard from Lawrence and Elian. From the panel discussion, we heard transparency, transparency, transparency. And what Elian and Lawrence just did was they showed you how to be transparent about your business. I love that Lauren said, if you're on your fifth iteration, you probably need 10 more to make it simple and clear. Um, know how to tell the story about your business, about the intricacies of your business to your lender, to your capital provider. Uh, fantastic conversation. Again, Lawrence, you are such a phenomenal uh, contributor to LBAN and to all of the programs that we do. So I just wanna say, Thank you again for the time and, and sharing of your expertise and your experience. All of you, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be having networking sessions in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to introduce um, our CEO to you. Many of you have not met him yet. So if we could bring to the stage Arturo Casares, and he can go ahead and share a few remarks. Hi, everyone. And th thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a minute and literally only a quick minute to first thank all the speakers for another very valuable um, seminar. This has been outstanding. And so thank you for all the speakers and the work that they put into these. Also, a big shout out to Bank of America. Without their commitment to Latino businesses and to small businesses in general, these seminars would not be possible. So a big thank you to Bank of America. And finally, to all of you, the business owners who participated today, we want to uh, extend our appreciation and invite you back. The next session is July 28th. Put it on your calendars. Don't miss it. And please help us spread the word. Tell other business owners about this and bring them with you. So again, I look forward to seeing all of you back here on July 28th. And so with that, um, stay with us. As Jennifer said, we have the networking session. Let me just transition back to Ilian and he can walk us through that. All right, thank you, Arturo, and congratulations again. Seeing some great messages from our crowd here. So everybody, as always with our session, we have a networking room um, that we have opened up on your app. You should see, uh, if you're following up on the web, on the left-hand side, you'll see networking rooms. If you're following on our app, one of the buttons is the networking session. We highly encourage you to stay there, talk, um, network with each other, and also sign up for our next session. Make sure you're here with us. Um, and any entrepreneurs that you know that should be here with us on July 28th for our fourth session, we're going to get into the weeds on customer acquisition and, and really getting those new customers as you start to grow your business. Maybe you start to acquire capital and you start looking at how do we expand? Definitely a session that you wanna follow up with. Um, I wanna check in to see if Jennifer has any other comments before we go into the networking room um, and we don't. So thank you everyone. This has been a fantastic session. Please go to the networking room, start talking. Uh, we have a mantra within Elban, do business with each other and get business with each other spend that time in the networking room and get that business. And so from the team, thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day.